the, uh, the unqualified name could mean really whatever you pleased. And that turned out to be a really good, uh, good choice. So uh, Haskell 98 um, uh, came out, and it was then in February 99. But it actually took another three years to get that stabilized. Language design is a slow and painstaking process. So um, at, at the stage at which we had got that stabilized, then Cambridge University Press published it as a book. And that's another big thank you to Cambridge University Press, because it was a book which they published with unrestricted copyright. So it was a BSD-licensed book, one of the very few, because we couldn't get the rest of the Haskell community wouldn't agree to copywriting their report um, for, uh, for Cambridge University Press. So I thought that was an admirable flexibility. Then followed a kind of growth spurt um, in the, la the last uh, five years. It's been a bit of a growth spurt for Haskell. I want to say a little bit about that. Here's the, um, the way in which most research languages go. So the horizontal, <laughs> the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is a logarithmic scale of the number of users. Um, and I reckon up to about 100 users, you're speaking to geeks, and then you start to break into practitioners. So this is what happens to most research languages. We're at the sort of 99% level now for a number of programming languages. Then a successful research language simply dies more slowly. <laughs> this is what happens to it, and on a sort of five-year time scale. Now, uh, th then there's mainstream languages that do this. They, uh, they don't die at all. In fact, they go through this sort of threshold of immortality at which it becomes impossible to allow them to die because there's just too much code written using them, so they become essentially immortal forever. Um, so then Haskell has done something a bit unusual. Haskell went, went through the, to the sort of geeky level and stayed there for a while, but just in the last five years, it's picked up in, a, in what feels to me like a qualita qualitatively new way. And I've written down here some comments from blogs uh, uh, that, that I uh, culled. Um, just to indicate the different kind of person that started using Haskell. And it's, it's, it, they're amusing to read these. You can read them yourself. But I like this one that said, learning Haskell is a great way of training yourself to think functionally so you are ready to take advantage of C Sharp 3.0. <laughs> so that tells you many things, right? That tells you that functional features are making their way into mainstream languages and also that it's a good sort of training ground. So I, I, I like this, uh, this, this blogger. Um, so I thought I should try to give you some data for this, uh, this uh, upward um, pointing tick. Uh, it's actually very difficult to get data on what's happening to Haskell because it's a kind of open source, public domain kind of thing. We don't sell licenses. But here are some. So the top one, these are all on a scale which go roughly about 2,000 to the present. The top one is traffic on the Haskell Cafe mailing list, which is a completely wild mailing list, and it seems to have been rising pretty sharply. The, um, the middle graph is the uh, Haskell um, IRC channel, which has, uh, this is um, uh, thousands of, uh, of names, thousands of users. At any moment, there's a couple of hundred people logged onto this IRC channel. And the bottom one is, uh, well, this is to do with my compiler, our, our compiler for Haskell called GHC. Since we don't really know how many people use GHC because it's free software, the only way we have to track usage is bug reporting. So this is a sort of exponentially increasing bug reporting uh, <laughs> Uh, log for GHC, which uh, you may take to, to mean that GHC is becoming less reliable, but I take to mean that more people are looking in more places. More eyeballs will definitely reveal more bugs. The things down the right, there's a lot of elaboration of this in the paper about uh, the stuff that's going on in the Haskell community at the moment. So, backing up then, I just want to say a little bit about what I think is um, important about Haskell. So when all this is dust, you know, when we're looking back in 20 years' time, what will be important about this stuff? And I want to just uh, focus on three things very quickly. Can I just find out about time before I get completely lost? Where are we, how are we doing? How long have we got? About half an hour? About half an hour. Yeah, good. Um, so, purity and laziness, type classes, and I want to say a little bit about process and community. There's actually a lot more stuff in the paper, but I, I've sort of tried to boil it out for the purposes of this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so here we are. Laziness was the rallying cry that uh, drew, us, that drew that particular group of people together to build Haskell. That was the one thing that distinguished that, 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 that distinguished that particular group. What we were trying to do was to build a lazy functional programming language. And John articulated the case for laziness very, very beautifully in his, his paper, Why Functional Programming Matters, which has become part of Holy Writ um, since, uh, along with John Backus's paper. It's, it's uh, written on tablets of stone. Um, and and um, in it, he described how, um, uh, how lazy evaluation isn't just a, a uh, kind of cute trick that lets you build infinite data structures that are kind of uh, uh, entertaining but not useful, but it's actually a trick that enables you to build more modular programs. So um, 
that's all very well, but in fact, laziness does have its costs. It has some implementation costs because it makes your implementations run slower, and we can work hard at improving that, but we're unlikely ever to get back to completely the stage you are if you're using call by value. But also, um, it's, uh, it, it, it makes it more difficult to reason about space and time behavior, and I, don't, I think we underestimated that problem at the beginning. We didn't really uh, worry so much about predicting behavior, so, um, but in Lawrence Snyder's talk, he was saying how important it is to have predictable uh, space and time behavior for parallel programs. It's no less important for sequential ones, but we take it for granted more on sequential programs, and Haskell really makes you stop taking it for granted. I'm afraid to say. So here it is. Laziness has its costs, right? So if it has its costs, um, then is it really worth the cost? So, and here's the, uh, the biggest reason that I think it is. In the end, the really important thing about laziness in, in, in Haskell, uh, so this is me speaking personally now rather than on behalf of my co-authors, is that it, it keeps you pure. Right, so every call by value language has succumbed to the, the siren call of side effects of being able to just say print this, or uh, uh, launch the missiles, or um, uh, assign to this global variable. Um, but in a lazy language, um, that really doesn't make sense. In a call by value language, you can just about make sense of uh, saying um, uh, of, of uh, uh, functions in quotes that have side effects. In a lazy language, you can't. Look at this one here that says uh, the list. This is square brackets, the list, print yes, print no. Well, in a lazy language, you don't know whether the consumer of this list is going to evaluate the second element first, or the first element first, or neither elements, or both elements. So this is very bad. So in effect, then, side effects become insupportable. You just can't mix them with laziness. And what that means is, no matter how much we must have envied our, our brothers and sisters in the ML community, we, 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 uh, we, we envied them a lot, but we could not give in, right? We could not make a deal with the devil. Um, but it was embarrassing, right? Because we had a language that really didn't initially have very good I.O. at all. And again, our, our colleagues, when we went to research conferences, they were incredibly polite about not pointing out that the emperor lacked I.O. <laughs> Um, and it, and it kind of it is a bit embarrassing to parade down Broadway match, m m lacking important pieces of, uh, of wardrobe. Um, but nevertheless, so we did, and it's a great incentive to ingenuity when this happens. So we were, we were embarrassed, and we, um, but eventually, uh, one way or another, we came up with this, uh, we came up with various forms of I.O. that are described in the paper, but ended up um, uh, fixing on this monadic story that probably many of you have heard of. So I'm just going to quickly um, whip through a little bit of that for the benefit of those of you who've not, who or don't already uh, eat monads uh, for breakfast. So here it is. If you want to, um, uh, to do, let's, let's focus just on input-output in, uh, in a purely functional setting, one way to do it is to say that a value of type IoT is a computation which, when you perform it sometime, will do some I.O. and then deliver a value of type T. So now, uh, getchar, then, is a computation which, when performed, will do some I.O., in this case, reading a character from the input and give you a character. And putchar is a function that takes a character and delivers a computation which, when you perform it, will print that character. So those are the primitive operations, and then we, then we need glue for gluing together primitive operations into bigger ones. So this bind operator here, the one that's written angle, angle, brackets, equals, takes a, uh, a computation as its first argument, and a function that expects the result of the first computation as its input. So then it's, um, I can write a, a program here that says get char, and then binds the result of that get char to A, and then does get char again, binds the result of that to B, um, and then prints B, and finally returns the pair A and B. So I'm not going to pause very long on this, just, just to say that this is a way of allowing you to glue together big I.O. things out of little I.O. things, and these I.O. things are values, they're first class values, which could be passed to functions, uh, stored in data structures, and when finally performed, as the, the, main, uh, the main function of a program, will actually execute and do something to the world. Now, um, all these lambdas make it look a little bit intimidating, particularly as they bracket very heavily to the right. So Mark Jones, who is also floating about Mark, over here somewhere, invented the do notation, which is just syntactic sugar for all those binds. So the stuff on the right is just desugared into the stuff on the left by the compiler. And by design, the stuff on the right looks like C, or very nearly like C. So it kind of begins to look as if you're doing imperative functional programming. And that indeed was the, uh, the title of a paper that Phil and I wrote about exactly this stuff. So that started to um, enable us to mix um, uh, pure and, pure and uh, side-affecting computation in a single program. 
Um, once you can get computations as values, then you can start to do things like um, build your own control structures. Rather than having them built in like for loops and while loops, you can write for loops and while loops as functions. And here is one. Repeat n is a for loop. It takes an integer and a computation 